honored to have Carolyn Shoemaker here to talk to us today about the comets, the discovery of comets, and in particular the uh, comet which she and others discovered uh, earlier this year, which is going to well, probably well, impact Jupiter next July. She got a BA in History in 1949 and an MA in Political Science in 1950 at Chico State University. Of course, because of her marriage relationship, she got involved in impact cratering studies and observing. Uh, she and Jean Shoemaker have been working, particularly in Australia, doing field work exploring the craters of that continent and recovering meteorites there. She's the discoverer or co-discoverer of 29 comets, more than any other person alive today. It's a pleasure to come to Ottawa. I haven't been here before. And uh, I find it a really charming place. I can tell it's very pretty when it's sunny. <laughs> and it's not too bad when it's cloudy either. Coming from Flagstaff, Arizona, in the high mountains, uh, the temperature feels about right to me for this time of year, so that's nice too. The work that, that Jean and I do is very much a fringe topic, as we were just remarking. It's not quite geology in the traditional sense, and it certainly isn't astronomy in the traditional sense. Astronomers do not look at things in the solar system, and that, of course, is what we do. By the same token, lots and lots of geologists are not comfortable with the idea of things falling out of the sky, big rocks up there. They, they should all be down here, particularly down there in Australia. <laughs> but uh, what we do is very much a combination. It's sort of a mom and pops operation because it's low funded, it's something that we do together. And at the same time, it uh, combines both the astronomy that I'm interested in and the geology that Jean is interested in. And uh, it's a pretty good mix. By the time I followed him around for lo these many years, my, uh, the geology has a lot of fascination. And by the same token, he's very interested in the astronomy. We think that impact geology it has a very big part to play in the solar system, certainly on Earth, but also on the other terrestrial planets and on the satellites of Jupiter and possibly the satellites of the other gaseous planets. We're interested in impacts in all of these areas and the things that make them. And we know that these impacts were caused by asteroids and comets, that they've happened many, many times throughout the history of the solar system, and that they will happen many times again. Um, and of course, that includes the Earth. So we're interested then in what hits and where it has hit, and that's the Australian part of the work. But today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our observing program, how we do it, what we're looking for, and then I want to tell you about a special comment that has quite a bit of significance, we think, for the impact history of the Earth. We go each month of the year, each lunation, to the telescope at Palomar Observatory. This is not the, the biggest telescope, there is the first telescope that was built on Palomar Mountain. It uh, holds the 18-inch Schmidt, 45 centimeters. That's a small telescope by uh, all standards. But at the same time, it's a very wide-angle field of view. It allows us to cover a great deal of sky, and that's the thing that's necessary in finding comets and asteroids. We go for seven nights each month. We use film, which is very helpful when you consider the costs of film versus glass plates these days. <coughs> and uh, we take, we have taken, in the course of our 
study, the uh, PACS observing study, which is a Palomar Asteroid and Comet Survey. We've taken over 7,000 fields. We've uh, found more than, we've seen more than 10,000 asteroids. We've, uh, we commonly discover approximately 50 to 55 asteroids of unusual motion each year. And on good years, I found as many as five comets. On poor years, I haven't found any. So uh, it just depends on what is out there when you're looking, both for asteroids and comets. This is the telescope that we use. You can see by our scale that it's not a very large telescope. But at one time, the 18-inch Schmidt was the largest Schmidt camera in the world. It's been a real workhorse through the years. When we take our films, we take pairs of films, approximately 45 minutes apart. And this allows me to look at the films on this stereo microscope. That's a big advantage in looking for things. The old-fashioned way, although it was not the original way, was to use a blink machine and compare one glass plate with another. And if you blink back and forth between the two, then uh, you can see any object that's moving. With the stereo microscope, which is much easier on the eyes, I can uh, look at one film with one eye and one film with the other eye, and then uh, the wonderful brain combines those images. If there are things that are moving, that are close by, like asteroids and comets, they come floating up and all the stars and all the galaxies, all the rest of those interesting things lie down nice and flat. So it's an easy way to discover things. This last march was an unusual march. It was an unusual spring at Palomar. We had gone in January, and uh, we only had a few good nights of observing. Then in February, we had virtually nothing. And that was the first time ever that we'd been wiped out for seven nights in a row. I think we had about two pairs. Then in March, we were really ready to go and discover something. And the first night was a beautiful night. It was one of those crystal nights when you feel like you can see forever. And uh, we started taking our films as soon as it was dark. Uh, as soon as we had about four films, I went down to develop those. And then after they had developed, she went down to check them out. We wanted to be sure of the focus. And he pulls out his handy geologist's hand lens and takes a good look. And, and uh, he didn't even have a chance to do that. The first films were totally black. And <laughs> we, we were just dumbfounded and very dismayed. The film that we use is a 4415 technical pan. It's a slow film ordinarily, but very fine grain. And by hypering this in forming gas in an oven of 65 degrees, we can speed up the emulsion so that we can take eight minute exposures throughout the night. We can go quite deep. On a good night, we can go to a 19th magnitude, barely. And on a bad night, we do at least uh, 17 magnitude. That's a night with some cirrus or A's or pinatubo effects. But this night, it looked like we didn't have any film. And what had happened was that during the previous two months, we had hyper film ready to use and been unable to use it. So we put this carefully into a box that was tightly sealed, took it back to Flagstaff, and stored it under a table in a room where I do a lot of my scanning with the microscope. Then we took it back to Flagstaff in March. I uh, back to Palomar in March, and lo and behold, someone, we have no idea who, had opened the box of film. Well, happily, there is a pretty good backing on those films, so that when they are stacked tightly, uh, light doesn't always leak into the film. and could 
could see that the exposure was around the edges, but we could still go ahead for the night observing, and we did that. But then the next night, <coughs> we had hypered some fresh film, and we were ready to go. And we took one set, which took a little over an hour, and then we started on the next set, and Cirrus moved in. We, we could see that uh, we might very well be clouded out. We knew that a storm was predicted, and uh, here, here we were with our fresh film, unable to take, or we could take and possibly waste it. At uh, $3 a film, when you take 50 films a night for seven nights, or you think about the cost a little bit, especially when it's a low-funded project. So we were standing around outside wondering what to do, and uh, David Levy was observing with us that, that a particular month. He observes with us six months of every year, and those of you from Canada probably know, either know David or know of him. He's uh, a great amateur commenter, comet hunter, an author, and a lecturer, and uh, marvelous to have at the telescope. Three of us were standing around wondering what to do, and David said, don't we have some more of those exposed films that we could use when the weather's bad like this? So, uh, we looked at the sky and thought maybe it was getting a little better, and said, let's go for it. We took two films, and the Cirrus moved over, and we had to stop. Now, those were just single exposures, and they wouldn't do me any good on the stereo microscope. I wouldn't be able to see anything. But uh, an hour and a half later, it cleared just a little bit. We took two more exposures, and that was it for the observing room. This is what those films look like. And by the end of the first night, I, I had to finish scanning the first night's films. So then, on the second night, I uh, decided, well, I may just as well go ahead and look at these films that had been exposed and see if I had anything. And uh, when it was first developed, this is just one of the films of a, a particular pair. Uh, Jean said, oh, I've, I've got one of those bad films. He could see all that light struck part around the edge. And he saw this big blob and figured we were really wiped on it. But I knew as soon as I looked at that pair, aha, this is our field that has Jupiter. And this was simply Jupiter, uh, kind of overexposed, but uh, Jupiter with its uh, with the, the marks that always come out from it. And another one over here, and this is the ghost image of Jupiter. And I thought, well, this is a pretty good field. I've found a comet on this field before, maybe this year. So I went ahead and scanned it, and I was cruising along. I go back and forth across gotten down to about here, and there's an image that you can't see, but there on the films was a most striking and startling image, and I nearly went past it. I thought, that's not a galaxy, and we see a lot of galaxies. Some of them are, are edge-on, some are full face, some are just a little bit that way. We, we see all sorts, and I thought this was an edge-on galaxy, and started to move on, and I said, that's not a galaxy. And I backed up and uh, took a good look. And I saw an image that looked like this. Now this is much, uh, much enlarged, as you can, might guess from the film that you can see. And uh, it, was, it was, I knew, something special because it stood up in relief. And I had it on both films. This is the this is the pair as I, as we combine them. If if you're good at seeing stereo, looking at at uh, aerial photos, you might be able to combine those images in your mind. It was a strange looking object, and I I could see all of this sort of coma coming out. And I could see some wings that don't show here because with two images you can see more than than just the one. 
And, and I, I turned to Jean and I said, this looks like a squashed comet. I don't know what it is. And, and I knew that no comet I had ever seen looked like that. They are, they're all sort of round, and some of them have tails and coma, but never like that, a bar with coma coming out or tail. And so Jean hastily looked at it, and David Levy looked at it, and Philippe and Joya, uh, a French astronomer who was with us that month, and who had been <coughs> studying the breakup of asteroids, uh, also looked at it. And we were really puzzled. And we said, well, it sure looks like it should be a comet. But why does it look like that? And uh, we went off to dinner and came back. And I said, we, we've got to do something. And, and uh, Jane and David went and measured it, and we reported it to the Minor Planet Center. But we were clouded out at that point. We, we couldn't possibly take a, take a follow-up pair. And David remembered that uh, Jim Scotty, an astronomer in Tucson, was on the telescope that particular night. And Jim uses CCDs so he could go deeper than we could, and he would be able to see for one thing, whether it was still there. We didn't know how long it had been there or whether it would still be around. And uh, we decided we would call him. We really hesitated because in the comet game, if, if you are asked to confirm a comet, then you are never considered a discoverer. And we didn't really want to do that to Jim if we could avoid it, but we knew that clouds were going that direction, and we thought he might still be able to see it if he hadn't already. So we telephoned him and, and gave him the positions. And, and he, like us, said, well, that's kind of close to Jupiter. It might just be an artifact in the telescope. Uh, but he would take a look. And, uh, and we had a chance to call him back. Uh, we had a very excited Jim Scotty on the telephone. He said, boy, have you guys got a comet. And he said, I can see five nuclei. And they all have their own little tails. And he was very excited. He spent the rest of the night on, the, on that particular comet, just taking images. This is his CCD image. And this particular image is particularly good because you can not only see the coma coming out here, but you can see the long wings. Notice they're slightly tilted. And this was, the comet was moving away from us and in that direction. Uh, and he was able then to confirm the, the fact that it was a comet. And uh, when he, did, he reduced his data further, that he could, was able to see about 10 images. The succeeding night, Vyshlov uh, Minusky took an image on a much larger telescope, and you really begin to see the various nuclei, as well as all of the tail. In Hawaii, David Ju Jewett and Jane Liu, on a much larger telescope, also took another image. And of course, this is false color. But again, you can see more and more nuclei. And for a while, we thought this was one, as far as we can determine, but it's actually four. And ultimately, they have, have followed it continuously, as has Jim Scotty, and they have seen 21 nuclei altogether. Space Telescope got into the act. We, we knew we needed to define the images a lot better. And this was one of the images that they took then in July, several months after the discovery. And the nuclei stand out very well there. Again, we don't know for sure how much of that nuclei is coma <coughs> and how much is, is actually the real thing. What we're trying to find out is how well, how big they are. What is the size of each nuclei? How big was the progenitor before it broke up? This is an enlargement of, the, of one section and of the brightest one. And this is the one that we had thought 
was one and is really four. They are hoping that after the space telescope is worked on in December and the comet again emerges from the, the sun, uh, we'll be able to really define the size of the nuclei. <coughs> Is there any idea of the sweep? No. Yes. Uh, at the time that we discovered it, uh, the, the whole sweep was about the length from the Earth to the Moon in distance. When uh, it impacts, and the orbit has been determined well enough to know that the comet is an orbit about Jupiter and that it will impact, at that time it will be about 7 million miles long. The impact uh, has been determined to be July 21st, plus or minus five, three days. A actually, it's closer to about a five-day period, at which point um, all of the, the main train will have gone in. It's been determined that the orbit is such that the dust, the particles, wings, will start going in to Jupiter about two months before that, and two months after that. And also that the tail will miss the impact. Oops, let me go back. I didn't... I wanted to tell you, this, this is one of the studies, and this is what uh, Hal Weaver has come up with from the Space Telescope. Uh, on the largest nuclei, the diameter is approximately uh, between 2.5 and 4.3 kilometers in size. That, that's the best he can determine from the space telescope images at this time. Now that isn't the, cons the total consensus. Uh, one of the studies done by Jim Scotty and Jay Malosh in Tucson Shows, shows this sort of effect. We have Jupiter here and the breakup or disruption which occurred a year ago, July 8th. And uh, that was at that time uh, the comet was close to Perijove. It uh, actually did not break up at, at the exact moment of Perijove. It's been determined that that happened approximately an hour and a half later. And of course, one of the fascinating parts of this study is to figure out what caused the breakup, why did it break up, and when did it break up. And at that point, uh, the comet was within the Roche limit of Jupiter. The tidal effects were, were very strong. And of course, that's probably the cause of the breakup, along with the fact that comets are not very well cemented bodies. What was Perijove? What distance? Uh, Perijove was actually within 1.6 radii. And, and the Roche limit is out somewhere around a little over 2. So that uh, it was well within that limit. And uh, the, the pieces broke up somewhat like this. And then what has happened with the orbits is that the pieces that were closest have had an orbit within the dashed line. Those that were farthest away are more like the outer line. The comet uh, pieces, the nuclei, have been spreading apart gradually. And at the same time, the comet was moving uh, essentially very slowly. <coughs> it was very hard to determine the orbit of this particular comet. The, the pieces by spring of when we discovered it, were about like this, all lined up very nicely and uh, coming around on the orbit, approaching Apogee when they're farthest away from Jupiter. Um, at this point, this, this cartoon uh, was produced by Don Yeomans. It's not quite right. The, the comet was more in this orientation and then it is swinging around and at the time that it goes in on July 21st, give or take, 
the pieces will be lined up in this fashion. And that means that they will hit successively at the same point relatively on Jupiter, but not all in the same place because, of course, Jupiter revolves. But it will, unfortunately, all be on the back side. Um, finding this comet was very exciting. It, it's a, it's a, a very rare event because no one has ever seen one in orbit about Jupiter before, and no one has ever seen one that has already broken up before. So uh, there was a great deal to learn about this. In this cartoon, where are you viewing from? In this cartoon, we're, we're viewing essentially, I think we must, the sun must be out in this direction. But we're looking down. The comet will come around, and it will come from the south and hit the back side. Of Jupiter, where, where you can't see, but just about at that latitude. <coughs> we're viewing in the spring, you were in the, in the, in the third dimension back there. Yeah. Was the, was the comet uh, already captured when it was disrupted, or was the disruption part of the It was already process? captured, and uh, there are some that, there have been various estimates. Uh, every day the new, the new information comes out, but there have been estimates that it may have been in orbit about Jupiter, perhaps for as long as, as 80 years. Now, <coughs> we know that there are other comets that have been in orbit about Jupiter. We know of three that have been discovered after they, after they came out from orbit, after they were flung out. And, and some of these comets can go into orbit and then they will be flung out eventually and then they may come back into orbit around Jupiter at a later time. Uh, one of these comets was Pio Terma uh, and another one was Helene Roman Crockett. And those were both found after they were had emerged from orbit around Jupiter and were on their way out, not to orbit Jupiter again. So this is the third comet that we know of, for sure, that has been in orbit around Jupiter. Now, uh, this is sort of the way it works. The lean Roman pocket approached Jupiter from up here, of uh, course, these are computer simulations. Approached Jupiter from up here, and then Jupiter grabbed it, came around this way, and went behind, and, and then got flung out. It was only in orbit for a brief time. But on the other hand, here are a couple more simulations. And you have the comet coming in, and it would be captured by Jupiter, and you'd go around, and this way, no, vice versa, I can see the arrows too. <laughs> the other way. <laughs> okay. Or there's a possibility that it did another fancy thing around and went back out. Very hard to, to detect just what, what could happen all the way around. If it comes back in the year 2075 to Jupiter, it will probably come in like this. It'll come around here and it'll do some really fancy things. And then it will be flung out again. And all of that takes uh, probably each loop around Jupiter would take uh, approximately two years. And then it will, will be flung out uh, after, after making some, some rather unusual orbits. But you can see that the orbits are really chaotic looking. Jupiter has a very strong effect. <coughs> And we can be really glad that Jupiter is out there capturing comets. Well, then we, we know of the sizes of P. Gerald's 3 and Helene Roman Crockett pretty well. That one was about 2 kilometers and the other about 3 kilometers in diameter. For this one, Jean really made a big guess. 
and and uh, <coughs> we think this is probably wrong at this time. At first, we thought that the, the comet was had to be around 10 kilometers in diameter, partly from the magnitude and and the magnitude that we could detect for the nuclei. Then, uh, when Scotty and Malash did a study, they decided that probably the nuclei, uh, the largest ones, were closer to uh, perhaps one or two kilometers in size. Then, uh, Hal Weaver, uh, in looking at it with a, a space telescope, decided that they were closer to five. And most recently, uh, all the determinations, those made by Don Yeomans and Paul Chodas at JPL, indicate that the nuclei were probably closer to eight kilometers, no, about four kilometers in size, and that the original progenitor is about, was about eight kilometers in size. Uh, the, these figures are certainly subject to change, and we hope that as spring comes along and uh, lots more observations are made before the comet disappears behind Jupiter, that we can tell something about those sizes. Now we know that, or we assume, that there is a steady state number of comets that are about two kilometers in diameter in orbit around Jupiter. Um, probably one at any time. We think that the main period uh, is about two years that they're in there. And uh, if we talk about the probability of collision of captured comets around Jupiter, uh, we should probably see one that's about two kilometers in size every hundred years. We should probably see one that's about 10 kilometers in size every thousand years. So the one that we're looking at uh, now, Kishumika Bibi 9, is, is really an unusual event. This shows something <coughs> of what we know. Uh, we Paul showed us a healthy orbit. Here's Jupiter uh, and Jupiter's plane. And uh, the comet is making the loop very much like this. You see, it just barely comes to Jupiter. But it, it comes to Jupiter enough that uh, it certainly will impact. This is another view. Here's Jupiter. And the sun is off in this direction. At the time of impact, uh, the sun will not be directly behind Jupiter. And that, we find, a very useful thing. Because the comet comes up like this, behind Jupiter, <coughs> here's the terminator, and here's the sun, we won't be able to see anything from Earth, except there's a possibility that we will be able to see flashes of light on the nearby satellites of Jupiter, Enceladus and, and, um, and Eon. We have tried to determine how can we look for this comet, how can we really see what's happening. Uh, there are two Voyager spacecraft out there, and one of those can look directly down the at Jupiter with the sun off to one side and would be able to see the impact. This has uh, posed some interesting problems because, uh, first of all, it's out at 40 astronomical units. That, that's a long ways away. It means that, <coughs> that uh, uh, the light would be about one pixel worth. <laughs> And, and so all you would be able to see would be the flash. But you can tell quite a bit from a flash as to when, when something was happening and also uh, how 
how strong it was. Voyager has been turned off, or the instruments were turned off for this sort of thing a long time ago. So it means that they have to reassemble some people who knew how to do the program. <laughs> Those are all dispersed or retired. <laughs> uh, and they have to recover the program itself to reduce the data. It looks like that's going to take place. And uh, we'll be able to observe the comet that way. Then secondly, uh, Galileo is out there on its way to Jupiter. And Galileo will be able to look from an angle over here, sideways, at, at what is happening. It can look at the Terminator so that it could see a flash of light as one of the nuclei go in, and then it can see what comes back out. How far below the horizon is the impact itself? Uh, the impact is basically <coughs> below the horizon from Galileo. It, it's it, within about two to three hours' time, Jupiter will revolve around, and it will be that the impact area will be in the sunlight. We would, we would be able to see it then. But Galileo would, would be in position to see it sideways. So it can see it as the, the flash as it comes in as a bright meteor, and then when, when uh, the fireball rises, it should be able to see that. So That's one of the studies that can be done. It's very close to the horizon. Yes. Uh, there is one other spacecraft that will be out there at that time, the Clementine mission, which hopefully will go in December, early January, on its way out, orbit the, the moon on a polar orbit for a while, doing, taking a lot of data, and will then proceed out to Geographos, another, and an Earth crossing, not another, an Earth crossing asteroid will, uh, at that time, at the time of this impact, be coasting along with nothing to do. So it's going to take a look at Jupiter with its special cameras and also at the satellites and see what can be detected. And this has some very powerful instruments. So those three uh, promise some really interesting data. This will show you better, Alan, since you were wondering. This is, the again, the bright side. The Earth's over here, and the sun's over here. But the comet will hit here between minus 30 and minus 60 degrees. And all of the impacts will be at approximately that point. None of them will be during the daylight on Jupiter. But it, it will revolve around, and we hope that we can see then what happens to the atmosphere of Jupiter when, when an impact occurs. <coughs> what we predict is that the object, the uh, nuclei will come in, and it will start showing bigger and bigger effects. It will take about one minute go through the upper atmosphere, the upper cloud layer. And then when it gets below that, uh, by that time, the energy, it, it will be dissipated, the energy will be released, and we'll have a fireball coming back up. The fireball will spread out in much that way. And if we can detect that fireball, we will uh, be able to tell a little bit more about the size and a little bit more about Jupiter. There are a lot of things that can happen as we uh, <coughs> see this. We, we expect effects in radio emissions, so radio telescopes are going to be looking at Jupiter. We expect gravity effects and hope that we can tell something about the gravity of Jupiter. Uh, there will be sound waves that can study. Uh, there are an amazing number of things that can be studied. As the, as the objects come in, we expect to be able to learn something about the magnetosphere. And we also hope that as the dust uh, comes in, 
we will be able to detect something, perhaps a Pinatubo effect on Jupiter as it revolves around. We don't, any of us quite know what we're going to see, but it, it's most exciting to think that out of this object we can learn a great deal about what happens in an impact, at least of a gaseous planet. You can see that uh, that fireball really goes up and, and it will spread, the effects will spread around. That would give us that Pinatubo effect that we hoped for. Now, all of the dust in the coma will not hit Jupiter, uh, in the t and in the tail, it will not hit Jupiter, but it will be captured, it will remain in orbit around Jupiter. And, and this can uh, have some really interesting quenching effects. Uh, it, could, uh, it could have all sorts of effects that we can't imagine quite. We expect to see uh, a lot of velocity, and we hope that we can start seeing some of this two months ahead of time when it first starts to go in. Eventually, uh, it is thought that a lot of this dust within 10 years' time will form another ring around Jupiter. It will, it will pull less that much as it comes in. This, this just shows a little bit of the direction of Voyager, that Voyager will see the impact. This shows the way that Galileo, Galileo will be looking, and uh, what we expect to see that way. Well then, what exactly will we gain from all this? I, I think we will gain a lot in terms of knowing what to expect from commentary. Effect. We think that this comet is about the same size as the one that impacted the Earth at the Cretaceous tertiary time. Gene and I feel that probably that crater at Chicxulub was caused by a comet, not an asteroid. Because most of the craters on Earth, according to theory, are caused by asteroids up to about 20 kilometers in size. The crater is about 20 kilometers in size. The really large craters are caused by comets, which come in faster. They don't have to be as big as an asteroid, but they come in a lot faster. And they cause bigger craters because of the impact energy. We think that if this object that we have discovered had hit the Earth, it would have created another Chicxulub. And if Jupiter had not captured it, we could have seen a real extinction of life on Earth. That's one of the things that we try to do with our PAC study, determine a relationship of impact to extinctions and to correlate, if possible, the, the craters that might have occurred at the time of such an impact. <coughs> Next July, I hope that you're all looking and waiting with bated breath. <laughs> I know that many of us throughout the world will be, will, will be looking to see what we can learn from this impact. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Any questions? Yeah, so don't be questioned. What's the difference between a comet and an asteroid? I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> basically, it's, it's what you see. Uh, a comet has coma. It has. It may or may not have a tail. It's. It has a lot of ice and usually a lot of gas. And when you get tails, one will be a gas tail, one will be a dust tail. An asteroid is a much more cohesive, rocky object. If you've seen pictures of Gaspra or Ida, uh, they look like they were pretty solid bodies and they've suffered a lot of impact on, on themselves. But uh, a
comet is distinguished by the puma and the tail. Now there have been studies, spectra taken of um, comet reading, shoemaker reading now, and we have not detected any dust. So that, that brought, uh, brought up the question, is this really an asteroid rather than a comet that broke up? But it has a lot of coma and it has tail. And that's basically the distinction. We didn't really expect to see a lot of gas, if any, because we haven't detected it on other comets out as far as Jupiter. If it were in closer, then you seem to get, get more, more gas coming out. The ice sublimates. And we've got a gas tail as well as a dust tail, but not out there. Maybe another naive question, but uh, you mentioned that comets come in much faster than asteroids, and I'm not clear to me why that would be. Uh, it's partly the chaotic orbit of a lot of these, although planet crossing asteroids are, are also chaotic. Uh, they, um, are they slower moving in deep space or further out? Or well, this was a very slow moving comet, but that, that's partly because we saw it. Uh, when, when it was close to, to closer to Perigeo, it was closest to Jupiter in, in the original breakup point. I don't know what to tell you, un unless it's something to do with the inclination that they come in. I just know that they, they do the How did it happen that Perigeo got so low? Is kind of not to be captured with that low of Perigeo? Uh, it can be captured without without that low of temperature. Yes, it it can be um, quite a bit further out. But but again, uh, each time that that it goes around Jupiter, because Jupiter Jupiter's influence is so strong, uh, the orbit changes. That's that's why it may come in, loop around a few times, and then get flung out. Yeah. Has anyone looked at Jupiter, you know, well enough ten years ago to say, you know, that it was not out gas and then, or would it have been then? The comet? We would all dearly love to to uh, find an observation of it before it broke up. Actually, at the time that we found it, it had been seen on other other images. There, there were plates taken by a young fellow who was just getting his PhD. And Preeti uh, had taken some plates a year before, and he had not seen anything uh, of Jupiter. He was doing his study on comets around Jupiter, okay. and comets captured in orbit around Jupiter. And he had not seen any in the previous year. Then, uh, a week before we were on the telescope, he uh, went back down to ESO, I believe, and, and took some more plates. And he saw the image at that time and thought, this is a strange looking thing. And uh, didn't recognize it as a comet because no one has seen a comet like this before. You, you don't expect a comet to be broken up <laughs> like that or to have that shape. So he missed it and that was that was really sad because that was his thesis. <laughs> uh, other, others had, had, there were a few other pre-discovery images. Again, people did not recognize it for what it was. But none of these images were before the breakup. So perhaps it wasn't we are, very active. It may not have been active before. <coughs> it may have looked like an asteroid before. Because um, until until a comet turns on, and it, it, it turns on as it, as it warms up and approaches the sun. So, so uh, that's the time that you see the comet in the tail. And until that point, when they're way out, they're, they're just a, a point of light on the film, on the telescopes. Uh, they look asteroid rather than cometary. 
We hope to get the plates that Tanpini took the year before and go back with an instrument at Lowell Observatory and check positions and see if there might be something there. It would help us a lot more to, to define the orbit and define just the size and, and what this was. But um, so far, no one has been able to find an image of it before. We would have had images in February had we had we not been clouded up with the telescope. Probably there would have been other images too, because I'm sure that we're not the only ones that take fields with Jupiter. Although most people try and avoid the glare of Jupiter and don't get too close to it. But there there would have been more images and, and it would have been found. The weather was terrible not only at Palomar but throughout the world, I think, last February. <laughs> Any place there were telescopes, it wasn't very great. <laughs> there wasn't a lot reported at that time. Are there other systematic commentary of asteroid observing programs that are used elsewhere in the world? Um, the other program that's carried on at, at Palomar Observatory using the same telescope uh, is a program which uses the other half of the dark room. Essentially, we are both looking for the same sorts of things. So if they, if they can find comets, they do. A lot of people don't recognize comets. Um, and, and particularly, it's hard to recognize a comet that, as a, that is very distant. One of the comets that I found had no coma at all. I just simply reported it as an asteroid, and it looked interesting, so we followed it on successive months as long as we could. We got a good orbit, and lo and behold, the orbit said, that's a comet. Uh, at that point, we were asked by the Minor Planet Center, do you see any coma or tail? And of course, I felt like saying, if I had seen it, you would have known it. <laughs> I didn't, but but we did ask Steve Larson and he said, if you would take a look, he was on, he's done a lot of work on comets and uh, uh, known comets, observing them and studying them. And so he took a look at that object and it was plain as day uh, on the larger telescope using okay. CCD. How many new comets are discovered each year? I would, I would hazard the guess that there are about roughly 10. There are a lot of comets that we see, of course, that, that are, are returns, the, the periodic comets um, come back usually anywhere. Well, there's, there's ones for Novich Kernick. I think everyone has rediscovered themselves who looks for comets, and, and I've rediscovered it a couple of times and gotten very excited, and lo and behold, when I look it up, it's Smirnova Chernik, and, and uh, that one comes back almost either every year or every two years, but, but most periodic comets come back, well, the, there are the short periodic comets that come back under 20 years. There are longer periodic comets that are beyond 20 years, and then then there are those that are the comets that are on orbits that just bring them in once and, and then they won't be seen again probably. Those, those, those are part of the new ones, but we found 10 periodic comets also. So, so they're, they are still out there. Just depends on. Depends on where they are, and there's so much of this game that depends on uh, on the weather. The weather's bad; you don't see anything. Depends on the time of month, you know, that you're on, and, and a comet may come across. Depends on whether they happen to be in orbit right there. <laughs> if they're not there, you can't find them. There are a lot of variables and a lot of things that can keep you from finding comets. Mm -hmm. um, can you go back to the, the spectrum of this object? Uh, you, you use uh, photographic plates, which probably means you're uh, sorry, film, which means you're, you're in the visible spectrum. Yes. Uh, you, and you then pass it to CCD people who are probably more into the near infrared. Yes. Um, what's the spectrum like? Is there an enhancement in the near infrared with this? 
Uh, I'm sorry. Is, is, is the infrared stronger? Is it enhancing the infrared? Uh, yes. A lot of the comets are, are pretty red looking. Mm -hmm. our, our film is, leans toward the red a bit, but, but not, not as much as the CCDs. You mentioned it's a very dusty, There's so it's cold out there, so there's not much gas involved in the comet, so much, most of what you see is dust. People looked at the tails and found to see the distribution of material sizes, how large the grains are. Are they very fine or...? Oh, we would like to. <laughs> <laughs> and, and those wings that I showed you coming out from each side, uh, it's almost certain that there are both blocks and fine grains in that, as well, as well as in the tails. But we cannot detect them too far out. And, and it's a very dusty comet. We, we haven't been able to tell what was in those. There are an awful lot of things about this comet that we'd really like to know more precisely and haven't been able to, to detect. A lot of the studies have been fairly recent, too. And, and, and a lot of it, uh, at first, of course, dealt with the orbit. And the comet was moving so slowly because at the point of perigee, it was almost equal pull, gravity pull, between Jupiter and the Sun. Uh, it, it really wasn't moving very fast for a comet at all. There's a question there. Uh, just a uh, question about the orbit of this particular comet. Yes. I just wondered, was there one particular data set used to compute the orbit, or was it a composite? Of, uh, uh, it's, a, a, it's probably a composite. Uh, the Minor Planet Center has done orbits, and Don Yeomans in California, the JPL, has done orbits. And um, what we don't know for sure are the orbits of the nuclei separately. And part of the problem is that when you see this image and, and you measure its position, us for example, all we could do, at first, we couldn't even see, we, we were not aware of the nuclei in that bomb. After we knew that there were such things, I went back and looked and I said, yeah, the, there's, I think I can see one. That was the what turned out to be four. Um, so all we can do is measure the center of that bar, but that's not necessarily the center of the comet. It's just the brighter part. Uh, people with other, other small telescopes have <coughs> similar measurements, but Jim Scotty has done a lot of C to C D measurements of the individual nuclei, and he's followed those, and so has Dave Jewett. And um, that information has gradually been coming together as they've had time to reduce it. So we're learning more about uh, the orbits of those particular nuclei, but, but not as much, obviously, as we'd like to know for sure. Um. How long do you think the effects of this are going to be seen in, in Jupiter's atmosphere? The reason, you know, after, after the impact. The reason I ask is, of course, is Galileo is going to drop its drop probe into the Jovian atmosphere a couple of years hence. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you're now going to be looking at a contaminated Jupiter. <laughs> I mean, it's a big planet. So. Um, we don't know. Wait, we. we we hope that we can see the effects enough that, that, that when Jupiter revolves around, we'll be able to see what's happened in some of the cloud layers. And at first there was speculation that something like this caused the great red spot, well, yeah, or some of those white spots that one sees. But uh, <coughs> we know enough about Jupiter to know that it can it can generate those all on its own. It doesn't, it doesn't need an object coming in. On the other hand, we know that those layers are going to be perturbed. And how much they'll be perturbed, we are not sure because we don't know the size of the nuclei. So some that, that are small will obviously break up 
further out. And uh, that may not cause a very lasting effect. Those that are bigger will go in a lot deeper. They may go in as far as 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers. We don't know. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Very interesting talk.